Are we thinking sequel ongoing or uh, I would love once, to hopeful once, hopeful once. Uh, I... Do you know what time it is? <laughs> Welcome to the Legacy of Nerd. My name is Daniel, and today I am here with an amazing guest, as you guys may see. But first, I want to introduce our official The Legacy of Nerd correspondent, Retro Ray. How are you doing, man? Dude, it's always good to be back talking about Power Rangers, man. Awesome, man. And of course, the man of the hour, um, co-author to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Return, the biggest thing to hit comic book stores in the last year, Matt Hodson, man. How are you doing today? Great. How are you guys doing? Doing good, man. Like, we're super excited. Me and Ray have been covering this book. Uh, well, I've been covering it on the channel since I found out about it. And then, you know, once the book came out, we've been doing our reviews. And, like, these were the first times I I've been sort of doing comic book reviews. And I've been having, like, so I was telling Ray, I'm having a lot of fun doing these. So I'm probably going to expand more into the comic book reviews because I, I, I have been away from comics for a long time. And, and this is one thing that really brought me back to it. Um, uh, starting starting off, uh, the first question is I have for you is um, we all sort of know like the story of how Amy Jo um, said like you know how she came up with the story, but like how did you become involved um, in writing this story with Amy Jo? Yeah, so before it was a comic book, someone had mentioned to her that you know E One, which is a production company, a huge production company, was owned by Hasbro and Hasbro owns Power Rangers. And she's a director, so it just seemed like there's a really good A, B, C, D of, is there anything Power Rangers that Amy Jo could come up with and be interested in, different from what was going on on the Netflix show, that she could pitch to E1 and be involved in? So she was brainstorming all sorts of ideas, which is where Olivia Hart, Green Ranger, came from. And she was, she said, oh, I need help brainstorming, just pitch stuff, like let's come up with stuff together. And she had this thing going on with Olivia and stuff, and, and she had a different sort of career and stuff. And one thing that Amy Jo had said to me was, you know, where would Kimberly Hart go after the Power Rangers? And in my mind, I thought she meant like now in, I mean, this is four years ago, but in the early 2020s, where would she be? And Amy Jo might know, like just a few years later. So I was way off track um, when I pitched her an idea of like, well, this when they're older and she had Olivia Hart. And as the idea for the, of both of her ideas and my idea just didn't make sense for a TV show or a movie at all. We were like, there's some really cool stuff here. And we could take this and we could take this and we could smush them together. And then it's like really, really cool. We think it's completely unfilmable, but what else could we do with this? And she had a stack of the Power Rangers comic books in her basement, uh, unbagged and boarded, I might add, which is really shameful. <laughs> uh, but she had met Kyle Higgins, who was writing the books a few years ago at some comic cons. And she was like, maybe it could be a comic book. And I was like, yeah, it should be a comic book. That's a great idea. And I went home and I came back the next day and I was like, it's a comic book. It has to be a comic book. Why would this not be a comic book? It's such a good idea for a comic book. Who would say no to this comic book? And she had sort of mentioned it in passing. And I just kind of dug my claws into the idea because I'm such a comic book nerd. Like nice. this would be an incredible comic book. And here we are. I mean, that's that's some, I mean, one thing that people don't realize is that um, there's a lot of love for the Boom Studios Power Ranger comic books. They are very well written. The stories are very drawn out. Uh, characters very much expanded on. They don't realize that Hasbro approves every single book and every single storyline that they go through. So I, I know for me, you know, as as you can see, I, I kind of like Power Rangers a little bit, but <laughs> um, I was really surprised when they announced it. For one, you know, I, I didn't see them going like a darker Power Rangers route. I know they kind of done darker in Boom Studios, but like this seemed like a much more realistic sort of darker. If you were to do any sort of Power Rangers story like that, and I, I was really, I was really taken aback by that. Um, not only that, you know, just Amy Jo. I we, we as a fandom, we didn't know if Amy Jo wanted ever wanted to come back to Power Rangers, and then seeing you know she wanted to come back, and that you had provided a, quite a bit of insight to where you were co-authoring the story, we were just like, this is crazy, man. So it was kind of a crazy time, especially during the announcements and even more so now that the comic books are out. Um, Ray, did you have a quick question? No, just so since you're a comic book fan, and of course we, we kind of were chit-chatting online back and forth because I kind of got that vibe from you when I was chit-chatting with you that you're into comics. Um, so where does your love for comics start? Because I mean, of course you, there's more we're going to get into, but where did it start for you for comics? First comic I ever saw was late 80s. So, you know, no internet. No, We didn't have a VCR yet. And I remember some holiday, my cousin came over and he had a copy of G.I. Joe Special Missions. I want to say it was number 22. 
Nice. And I'd never seen like in the eighties. That's mind blowing for a kid. Is it's not a picture book for little kids. This is like this is a grown up thing, and it's GI Joe. It's the cartoon, but you can hold it in your hands. It's like three D printing before three D printing exists. Yeah. Blew my mind. Um, that was the only comic book I saw for a while, and then we had moved, and we were at like a convenience store, and I saw Ninja Turtles Adventures, and I was a big Ninja Turtles kid, and so I had to have that comic book, and then it's been all downhill from there. Was Ninja Turtles like your thing when you were a kid? Like that was the big thing? Still nonstop. It's still my really? thing. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you do you collect or are you still follow any of the sort of storylines in the comic books like Last Ronin or anything? All of it. Yeah. I love all of it. <laughs> I have some, um, yeah. Like nonstop. I have some um Jim Lee or sorry, Jim Lawson art. Jim Lawson drew a lot of the stuff in the 80s. And you'll see some of the Ninja Turtleiness stuff bleeding into power rangers the return nice. like jim lawson did an incredible uh variant cover for issue number one um so maybe some other stuff seeping in if you if you take a look there's also i don't know if we've ever said this before in issue one they're at a diner and that yeah. diner is called chet's and if you read the old black and white 80s comic books the the name chet pops up in the ninja turtles comic books a lot so there's a nice, ninja turtles nice. homage. and then the the escorza brothers who drew the last ronin uh, this was not due to us at all they came on board and they're doing variant covers for the whole mini series and if you look at the variant covers with the power rangers it's they're just homaging their own last ronin covers from a few years ago so there's now power rangers versions of the ninja turtles last ronin covers which is super cool that is awesome man and i, I i'll obviously in return the number two um the colors yeah I, I think you know the poppiness of the colors and the bandana or you know the the mass of the turtles i that's kind of i can kind of see that now that you're talking about that um as a kid you know so you like ninja turtles obviously i'm hearing like you like gi joe as well was there anything else that you enjoyed as a kid yeah there's a lot that fell by the wayside and i mean power rangers was more my younger brother so i was more like gi joe transformers he man like the mid 80s late 80s yeah. stuff and then my younger brother was more power rangers pokemon um there was a second generation of ghostbusters i think extreme something like that yeah yeah and it's some of those things that like, you know, when you're a bigger boy, you look at stuff like Power Rangers and Pokemon, you grow up it pretty quickly. And you can't believe stuff like that is still going, which yeah. is completely hypocritical because Ninja Turtles is still going strong and is amazing. So it's really fantastic to see how, I mean, guys like all of us fall in love with something and manage to keep, we're, we're the ones that keep it going. Yeah. All these decades later, and that's sort of the fan base that we're trying to reach with the return. I mean, not only that, like, you know, we have fans that not only keep it going but that are now writing stories in in the properties that they they grew up reading you know or, yeah. or watching or enjoyed so you know obviously we see you're wearing a sweatshirt that says titans right now and um we know you worked on the titan show on well started on dc universe um and then moved over to hbo max before it became max but um how did you like gain entry into the industry what what brought you um your artistic side out that you wanted to go and make things well, I mean, comics and TV are very different. You ask me which one first. Okay, how about, how did you enter the industry as far as, like, working on shows like Titan? Sure. I mean, film, honestly, I always wanted to make comic books. I wanted to write and draw comic books. And I went to art college for a year. I applied for illustration. Wow. Not good enough at all. So I took a certificate program called, like, Art Fundamentals, Visual Art Fundamentals, where you get not a diploma or a degree, you get a college certificate, which is worth approximately nothing. But technically... With the word certificate, you can say that you are a certified artist. Uh, nice. So I do like to drop that in, but it means nothing. Terrible <laughs> artists couldn't do it. Um, and film and TV production, stuff like that, I there was sort of like my plan B, if I even had a plan B, because I thought it was interesting and cool, but I didn't love it like I did comics, which is maybe terrible advice or good advice, depending on how you want to look at it. If you pick something that you won't get your heart broken by, um, but still love a lot, that could be a good career path for you because that's what happened to me. Going to college for art and being told what to draw and how to draw and comics are garbage and this is trash and you don't yeah. want to draw like that. That sucked. That was a really crappy year. But then going to film school was fun and I was learning new things and it's a totally different type of collaboration and creation. And I fell in love with that and I've been doing that for my whole career. And what what are some, you know, we know we've only worked on Titans, but like uh, what are some other notable projects that you worked on that like you're like, man, that was fun? Uh, well, that's how I met Amy Jo Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I worked on a show very briefly called V Wars, um, which is a tough show. And and I was driving back from Toronto. I shot up north. I was driving to Toronto, and I had an email to do an interview for Amy Jo's movie. 
and it was a smaller indie movie compared to some of the other things I've been working on. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do a smaller thing. It almost feels like a step back. And I went to go meet with Amy Joe and her producer Jessica. And it just like just the the cynicism that it maybe had built up in me a little bit just melted away because here was two people who just like love making movies, want to make a movie, have a story to tell. They're so excited to meet people they're going to be collaborating with. And just I walked out of there being like, oh, I really hope I get this movie. I really, really, really want this movie. And I got it. And we had so much fun every day on that show. And it's one of the smallest things I had done in a while. Uh, but I look back on that as one of the best filmmaking experiences I had in my whole life, which was a good lesson for me. Because at that point in my career five years ago, I was really like, oh, what's the next thing and the bigger thing and the better thing and the cooler thing? And it's not always about that. A lot of it has to do with who you're standing side by side, collaborating, creating with. Uh, and Amy Jo is obviously the director, so a huge part of that movie. So that really changed my perspective on what it means to create and work in this industry. So even though that, that movie is called Tam is Always Dying, it might be a smaller thing. It's one of the best things I've ever done because we had a great time making it. Um, that's awesome, man. Right, right. No, and so I helped fund one of her Kickstarters for the movies that she was doing, her independent films. And one of the things that was cool about it was if you funded over 500 bucks, you were invited to a party in Santa Monica where you got to hang with her and a couple of the cast from uh, Flashpoint were there as well. Yeah. And then Billy was there. Uh, Billy, I'm sorry. Uh, David Yost. And it was cool. I mean, there was like cupcakes that had Power Rangers on it. And, and it was just such a cool event. Um, but yes, definitely. Like you're talking about the the film industry. Doing what you love. She she loves directing. Like if none of you guys have watched Flashpoint, go watch Flashpoint. It is an awesome TV show. It's about a SWAT team. If you've never seen it, go watch it. Uh, I don't know where you can watch it at now, but it's a good show. Uh, but for you working with her and i'm pretty sure you saw the love she had for directing and 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 seeing that perspective and it's the same thing with art as a comic book artist when you're working it's your imagination on how you see when you're filming and also the way you're drawing because each artist that you work with it's a piece of paper that you're writing you're giving them the description and they're to bring what you've written to life onto the page and it's cool when you find the artist that gets inside your head and makes what you want. And it's kind of the same way with the directing part. So how is it you having the love for comics now getting to work with all these awesome artists that you actually grew up, you know, looking at their art and stuff like, cause you've got some cool people. Like you've got a uh, discover they've got in the background. He, his artwork is phenomenal. And I mean, it's just every artist that you got on this comic is, is being in the industry. How did you yeah. do that? Uh, I I asked them, which <laughs> said, which, I don't mean it as a flippant thing. Is I would never, like, you're talking about the David Mack art in the background? Oh, yeah. His I, great. Like, oh, my God. I love his art. Yeah, and that's why it's like David Mack did the cover for my first ever comic book for, like, the special edition Kickstarter things exclusive, and he's done two of them, and they're insanely good. And I, and the David Mack, like I never, I wasn't a huge comic convention guy before I met Amy Joe, and she goes to a few of them. So I've tagged along and had some good times, but I would never go to David Mack ever in my life and, and assume that he would want to chat with me at all, which is nothing bad about David Mack. But what do I have to talk about David Mack about? Like, I love your art, sir. It's super cool. I just say the same thing that everyone else has said to him. <laughs> and David Mack, I, is a, it's actually a pretty great story is that David Mack did a book that's around here somewhere. It was, um, I say it was a Tori Amos, Little Earthquakes. There was a visual album for a Tori Amos album. Yeah, uh, that came out a long time ago. And the book came out. It was called Little Earthquakes. And we were in LA for LA Comic Con. And I know she liked that artist, Tori Amos. And I had heard about that book because I'd seen David Mack post about the book because he did the cover for it. And I grabbed that book at Golden Apple Comics right before LA Comic Con. And I had mentioned to her, I, I think you'll like this thing. And I showed it to her and I got it for as an early Christmas gift. She's like, I love the artist. Who's that artist? I'm like, that's this amazing artist named David Mack. She's like, cool. He should do something for the comic book. I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> duh. But like, <laughs> I, like, why would David Mack ever talk to us? Um, and I think literally two weeks before that, I had started looking up David Mack, seeing what he was doing. I saw A, he was going to be at LA Comic Con. B, he had just done a cover for Power Rangers 100. Yeah. He had like just come out. And he drew the Pink Ranger. So while Amy Joe was busy at LA Comic Con, I went on the floor searching for David Mack. I found him, introduced myself, 
told him he had to keep a secret because I, we told him, I told him about the comic book that nobody knew about yet. And I said, hey, when you drew that Pink Ranger cover, did they tell you to draw Pink Ranger? He's like, no, I drew Pink Ranger. Pink Ranger's the cool one. I'm like, all right, here we go. Here we go. And here we are. And now we have this amazing art behind us. It's it's because I had the guts to ask him because, uh, because of the secret project that we were working on. You guys give out great work as in the story and your ideas for the art and working with the artist as well because you you can find certain artists but they may not have the same mentality what you have that you've written and the artist that you got to do the interior which is kind of funny because right after i start talking to you the artist with the interior artwork said i just saw your review and he's in japan and he's like i just got a in the morning and i just saw your review and i liked your review i liked your guys review and i was like no way matt said the same thing <laughs> so it, it's just like i was in awe for both of those things it's so cool getting to work with people like you guys well you flatter me but it's you know i've only been on twitter for a couple months and amy joe urged me to join because <laughs> as i've gone to these comic cons and, and started talking to all these people like just the vibe at comic cons is so cool it's just people that have put this stuff out and don't know if people like it or yeah. they like they don't come up with sales numbers anymore not that sales numbers matter but interacting with these people they want to interact with fans and i'm a huge fan and so i've met nothing but amazing supportive people and you know i'll humbly go to them and like i have my own comic book coming out soon and the people that i've met who i mean i would just think were completely untouchable like david mack or guys like like ron mars who are these people that i've been devouring their creativity my entire life are so excited to pass the baton on and chat with the next generation of people and just share their love for comic books and geeky stuff. Yeah. And so and Twitter is just like a big giant comic con every day. <laughs> and I really, I was really, really reticent. I haven't been on social media my entire life. And, and every day there's just, there's this little corner of Twitter going, which is guys like you guys who just aren't afraid to love what they love and be proud of it and share it with the people from all over the world who love the same thing too. And like you said, Nico, our artist, who's so good, is yeah. in Japan, but it doesn't matter. Like you can reach people in Japan now and talk about the same stuff and love the same stuff. Yeah. So, so, so one thing that we had talked about uh, and that you had mentioned is that you had brought a lot of, um, you know, Easter eggs, I guess, for, for, for Ninja Turtles into, into Power Rangers of the Return. Are there any other influences that you brought in you know, just off the top of my head, just thinking like Dark Knight or, you know, any of those um, iconic sort of storylines or anything that you kind of like influenced you while writing this as well. People have said, old. Uh, I've said Old Man Logan a couple of times, which is, okay. I think you can oh, see, I mean, dude. we don't have like the devastated world, but when you look at Red Ranger, you can see the influence there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and for anyone that thinks that a Power Ranger who's, who's red having a brown half cloak doesn't make any sense. If you're going around and they're like you're like you're in a bright red suit, you need to like cover up with something brown and like neutral tone. So the clip, the case That's... does make sense. <laughs> um, I was very, then, I yeah, was thinking very '90s cable when I saw it the first time. I was right? thinking, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Last Ronin. There's definitely a bit of Last Ronin stuff in here too. Yeah. Now those are very, very dystopic, sort of almost post-apocalyptic. If you look at those storylines, we wanted a very grounded, real, natural world. There's definitely elements of stuff like that and, and Dark Knight Returns that you can see in this book creeping in. I mean, and the major difference is the story starts off with, like, this is total opposite. This is the Rangers won the war. Like, this is, you know, they have the, the you know, the Babylon. Like, they have, this is the peaceful time. There's not a need for Power Rangers anymore. And it's kind of almost like at the beginning, like, you know, when, when Kimberly is talking to Zach, like there's why are, there's no need to morph if there's no evil to fight. So, you know, I can see where you're talking about those influence, but at the same time, it's just like literally turning it upside down yeah. and saying, let's do it this way. Obviously we're going to have a threat because we have to have a story. Right. So, but they're, they're really, that's the one thing is like, where did you work? Like the tone, like, so the tone is very kind of somber at the beginning. Right. Cause you know, they're at a memorial for Trini um what what kind of set the tone when you're writing the story like this is this is where we wanted to start um for this reason goes back to the very first question that amy joe asked when she was brainstorming for what maybe could have been a tv show was where would the power rangers be after they were power rangers and so we extrapolated that to real time well let's age them in real time where would power rangers go after and we did like the idea of them winning 
because in in quote unquote the real world, like there's 30 seasons of Power Rangers TV shows where there's always a new threat and there's always a new team of Power Rangers. So let's get rid of all that. What happens when you're 15 years old and you're a superhero and you can't tell anybody and then you're not a superhero anymore? And we really wanted to dig into the character work of how that would affect Kimberly and how, I mean, if you look at Zach, Zach almost missed the the notoriety or the fame and sort of came out as a Power Ranger to sort of cash in on it a bit. You sort of look at all these different characters and what they were like with teenagers, age them up 30 years, where are they now? And that's sort of where the somber humanity comes into it. I mean, if you look at them as adults, there's a bit of meta stuff that we've tried to layer in of what is it like to be a Power Ranger, whether it's, you know, in the real world or an actor. 30 years later, what is your life like? How has it affected you when you're not a superhero anymore? And we definitely get the sense like they, they miss it. Well, you know, besides Kimberly, like, you know, they miss it. And I think one sense of like the kind of weirdness of the show was we had 14 and 15 year olds fighting a war. There were soldiers in a war. You know what I mean? And so, you know, of course, this was a show made for children. They made them younger. So, you know, that, you know, kids could relate to a little bit somebody a little bit better rather than it being an adult. Right. But, you know, looking back, if you're writing a more realistic and a and a more serious tone story, we, <laughs> you realize that those kids probably have trauma. Like and that's that's yeah. realistic. And one thing you know that really stuck out, especially in uh, you know one thing when you guys went to I believe it was San Diego Comic Con last year when you unveiled um, the the character uh, visuals, right? So it was like kind of the first sketches of what they may look like. Um, you know, we got our first glimpse of uh, I don't. He, he's called Renegade Red Ranger or Amy Joe threw out a different name recently, but <laughs> Rogue, Red, <laughs> Rogue, Red, said Rogue Red Ranger. So I think we've all latched onto Rogue Red Ranger. Okay, okay, okay. I think some of us said Renegade at the beginning, but um, what what was the ideas about recreating or bringing in? Because you thought the idea of like he's red, like he stands out. He has to be more like you know, I obviously like Batman, kind of works in the dark, so he has, he wears black, right? But like in that character design, why did you decide to go those certain directions that you did? He wanted and. And we, well, first of all, we didn't anticipate the reaction to this book at all. Um, we're, we're both so ignorant. I mean, like you said, San Diego Comic Con. I was the um, I wasn't working because the strikes had just started last early summer. So it's like Aunt Daph and our editor was like, "Oh, we're just going to do a quick little like two minute thing at the end of the Power Rangers panel and announce your book and show some character designs." And I was like, "We have to go. Well, let's go to San Diego. This is going to be incredible." <laughs> and he was like, "We're not going to San Diego to crash two minutes of a panel. I'm like, it'll be amazing." And they released everything and everyone was like super excited about it. It was super cool. And I can't believe I missed it. And it would have just been two minutes and it definitely would not have been worth it. But people keep bringing up that moment of San Diego. Like, look at these cool designs. With the Red Ranger, we wanted to have a character, one of the characters, I mean, Jason was a leader. Like what happens when you're a leader of a superhero team that wins? There's no reward when you have a secret identity and you save the world. There's no parades for you. I mean, maybe there's a Power Rangers statue somewhere in Angel Grove, but... No one knows what happened. You've moved on. You try to keep being a hero by being a firefighter, an emergency worker. But when Jason gets pushed too far, he goes over the edge and doesn't want to ever stop being a Power Ranger ever again. So no one ever has to die ever again on his watch. That sounds really cool and noble, but you can imagine that type of power. I mean, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Would push somebody over the deep end just a little bit too far. And so that's where the idea for Jason came from. We um, did not anticipate how much people would love the Renegade or Rogue Red Ranger. And if we could do it all over again, maybe there'd be a little bit more of him in the book. And maybe <laughs> we should do some more issues after issue four. would be great to show more of him. As people oh, love yes, him. for sure. For I that. mean, that's the first thing everyone said. We was like, we want an action figure like now. Yeah, where's the toy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that was that was pretty out uh, right out there. Who And I, I can't remember exactly, but who did those initial artistic designs? Was it Dan Mora? Dan Mora, yeah. Dan Mora. And I know Dan Mora is very, you know, entwined with Boom Studios, especially the Power Ranger uh, books as well. But, you know, at that time, you were still looking for the artist for inside the book. What were some things that you guys were considering while while choosing it? Because that's that seems like a very hard decision to make. Like, who's going to, you know, illustrate our book? Like, that's how did you decide on that? Yeah, I mean, we probably drove Daphne, our editor, a little bit crazy. Um, the Power Rangers books look cool and we love them, but there's, we really wanted our book to stand apart and look different right away. So there's sort of a stable of artists who've done the Power Rangers books for the last seven or eight years that 
are all sort of kind of similar, not to, to insult any of them. They're, this is sort of a look for the books. And we wanted to move away from that completely. So we had a big, I mean, Dan Moore, Dan Moore was at the top of the list, which is super critical because he had drawn the books for a long time, but he's gone off to DC, conquered the DC universe, and his style has changed a lot. Uh, so to get Dan Moore doing the character designs was awesome, but we knew he wasn't going to be able to do the book. Um, we had Francesco Mortarino draw the little eight-page short story we did in the 30th anniversary last year, which was great because he's a legacy Rangers artist. But we kind of went through a whole bunch of different people and we said, well, here's some people. And even if we can't get them, here's sort of like a group of artists who have sort of the style and tone that we're looking for. A little less manga-y, a little bit darker, more grounded in reality. And because when people hear Amy Joe Johnson, they're also going to be thinking about the actors. And the Boom books do a really great job of drawing the characters without making them look too much like the actors. And we kind of wanted the book to look not so much like Amy Jo Johnson or David Yost grown up as they are now, but what would Kimberly and Billy look like grown up? Similar, but not quite the same. And eventually Nico's name popped up on the list, Nico Leon. And I had known him from Brian Michael Bennis's Miles Morales Spider-Man stuff. Yeah. And just instantly, I, I like. I think I texted Amy Jo Mead, I'm like, he's the guy. He's the guy. Stand by. <laughs> and then I just started like screenshotting stuff on my phone, and just sending it and sending it and sending it and sending it. Eventually, he's like, "Yeah, yeah I get it. He's the guy. Clearly, he's the guy." <laughs> and <laughs> like, it didn't take that's, any convincing. That's what I feel like when Ray texts me, like, "We got an interview," and I'm like, "Okay, I get it. Like, we're doing it." It's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, but and you don't know Nico. Nico. Nico's Nico's art. I mean, and the thing is, it's kind of funny how you get him. So, if you guys don't know, um, Nico has a lot of ties to he he grew up on super sentai so this to me was like you gave him the keys to the world that he grew up in and just said okay here go play and <sighs> that's how i took it because for him growing up around super sentai it just like fit perfect mind that's just my opinion but i mean what are your thoughts on that you're 100 percent right. So Nico, I think Daphne, the editor, said Nico and 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 Nico and her had reached out just before Power Rangers comic book started, and the timing didn't work. But he had expressed what a massive fan nice. he was of all this stuff when he was a kid. And then all these years later, as Amy Joe and I are driving Daphne crazy with like this type of artist and this and this, and what about this and this and this? She's like, she was digging through her emails and came all the way back to whenever that would have been 2016. She's wow. Like, Nico, what's he up to? And saw his work on Catwoman, uh, and was just like, "Oh, I'm going to send this to to Amy, Joe, and Matt." And instantly, we loved him. And so it's great to see how his art has evolved over the last few years. And he, like, Cat, the Catwoman book is like dark and cool and set in Gotham City. And we're like, let's like, we want a bit of a darker tone, not Gotham City dark. Yeah. But we want some of that in our book. So he was just the perfect fit right away. And I've said this before in some other stuff. And so is Amy, Joe. Nico owns a red Power Ranger suit. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, well, he puts it on. <laughs> And he stands in the mirror and takes pictures, and that's how he gets his Red Ranger poses. Oh, and wow. Nico has found two of the stunt performers. I think he said the original Green Ranger and original Pink Ranger yeah. stunt actors from Japan are married. Yes. And they do self-defense and martial arts training in Japan. And Nico signed up for their classes and told them about the comic book so he could learn the Power Rangers poses authentically. Oh and then my take God. pictures of himself in the mirror and then put himself in the comic book. So Dad. when's the video game coming? <laughs> yeah, when's the video game? Where are the toys? Where's the animated series? Let's go. I mean, this is all video game work for sure. Like yeah, this is yeah. exactly the same concept. Yeah, yeah things Nico fill in the place. Yeah, Nico builds everything in 3D, which I've never seen before. Nico's still drawing issue four, but as soon as he is done, Nico needs to get on the internet and show people what a creative genius he is. He builds the juice bar in 3D. He builds the cat, like the bad guy's castle in 3D and wow. then pops it, populates it with hand drawn digital characters. So when you're working on a scene together, like issue, I have to be so careful not to spoil anything. <laughs> I have issue one and two in the 30th anniversary special because, like, we just, uh, issue three is done and we just saw and we were going through and approving everything. And so what I think is out is not out. At the end of issue two, yes, Kimberly is fighting a new villain in her house. So Nico created uh, Kimberly's house in 3D. And then we said, well, the, when the fight happens here on these pages, he built 3D models of Kimberly and this character 
and like animated them in 3D. Like he's wow. working backwards. He's building 3D movies and then turning them into comic books. That's amazing. For a couple of pages. And he shows us how they move and how she's going to dive underneath. And he's like, Nico, this is insane. And nobody knows about it. So I'm here to preach the love of Nico Leon because he's an incredible artist. No, how he was is. it I mean, when you opened that first book, man, and just like, you know, are there, when you got, I'm sure you get it differently, obviously, but when you saw the first works that come in and what was that, what was that feeling like? The best feeling in the world. It really is. When you start getting pages for something you've written, and this took, it took four, four years from when we started pitching the book to boom to when the book came out. So it wasn't until like last September, October, we started getting pages and finally it felt real. You know, like even after like contracts are signed and they've made announcements and all these things are going on. When your artist starts sending you pages of the book, you just breathe a sigh of relief and then it's like Christmas morning. And for me, this project and doing comics in general is a dream come true. So those first few pages, I'll never forget that day because you're just like, oh, this is amazing. And just you sit back and watch and, and watch them work and it's every day is great. That's awesome. Um, and, and going back, I'm going to go back a little bit because you brought up the, the 30th anniversary prelude, right? So, and I had talked about one of the reviews like, be, like we can't believe this is a four bit book run because like it just seems like so much is packed into each book but we didn't have that prelude i think it would have been a lot harder to do um some of the things from the prelude was very like you know it's two pages and you had to set up an entire setting an entire you know universe you know separate universe you know assuming that the audience has a basic understanding of of the characters right so you guys obviously you decided that there's no rocky aisha and adam um, you know, they never got past, it seems like, you know, season one and a half, like somewhere in the middle of season two, um, you guys made the decision to, you know, bring, you know, uh, Kimberly and Tommy together. Um, and obviously I, I can see that now going into issue two, as far as, uh, emotional ties and stuff like that. But what were, what were some of the hardest things to, um, fit? <laughs> Cause it was like two pages. Like that's really what it was. Right. Or maybe it was eight, pa it was eight pages. Yeah. It was eight pages. Tiny. It felt pages, like a yeah. small story. So, <laughs> uh, small. what did it like? How hard was it to decide like what we're going to put in the prelude to not spoil what was going to happen in the main story? It's funny. It's almost the reverse of that. Is that the prelude didn't exist for such a long time? Like we, I mean, we've got so many different versions of these scripts over the yeah. years as we were just waiting for the project to actually start. But the the whole miniseries was kind of written before the prelude in a weird backwards way, is that we really wanted this to come out. I mean, look, we wanted this to come out four years ago or three years ago, two years ago, but the 30th anniversary last year felt really perfect and we wanted to celebrate the original team. Um, and then for various reasons, I don't think it was sort of able to come out last year. And like everyone had once and always, so we didn't need another 30th anniversary thing. Like the return that would sort of maybe conflict or confuse anybody, which totally makes sense. So when the book, when we realized the book was going to get pushed until 2024, Daphne, our editor, was so smart. At, she's like, but there's this 30th special coming out in August, like two days after the real anniversary. So let's get something in there to announce it. Because something that had happened was with Hasbro, it has been nothing but supportive. Hasbro is very protective of Power Rangers and wants to make sure no one's ever confused. So here we are just sort of selfishly throwing out 28 years of continuity and doing our own universe, our own what if style. And they were very, very adamant, like, we don't want to confuse anybody. We need to set up how this happens, blah, blah, blah. And it all made sense. But we also didn't want to take what is a very short four issues and have, you know, the first 10 pages of the first issue explaining the world to everybody. We kind of wanted the readers to be catching up along with us. So Daphna gave us eight pages in the 30th anniversary special, and that solved all the problems. We got to explain where the world diverged and how it diverged. We got to do it in a way that knowing a 30th anniversary special is probably going to be purchased by like hardcore fans from 30 years ago. I got, meant four, that issues, so. I got four <laughs> copies, all different covers. <laughs> so. And then and then it means when issue one of the book starts, we can go be, be off to the races and just go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you guys made the really hard decision. And obviously now that I didn't know that the prelude came after, um, because we see the scene of uh, them in the rubble of, of the command center. What, what was, I mean, we ha I guess I understand now you have to have a catalyst to start off a story, but that's a big catalyst. Like where where did that come from as far as um, destroying uh, Zordon and Alpha? We wanted to take away their parents. 
like when the characters, even like when the moon blows up, I think it's like 2001 in our universe. So there's still like early 20s and you just want to take away the support network and you want to take away the dad and you want to take away the rules. Like Zordon's got very specific rules about like escalating battles and when you go into Zords and all of that stuff. And if you take that away and there's no one to guide them and it feels like this is it, how far do the Power Rangers get pushed and what happens when you see them pushed beyond their limits? I understand. Uh, Ray? So, got a question. So, with going back to this background, and I'm pretty sure I'm, I got to ask, this is just you know, for art-wise. Do you own any original art for any comics that you love? And did you get the original art for this cover that David Mack created in the background? <laughs> oh, I want it so badly. Uh, I work in film and TV, so there were strikes. So we were out of work for a long time. So maybe I, I couldn't afford it. Uh, not that it's it's very reasonably priced for what it is. The trick with David Mack is that all these different layers are different pieces. Yeah. So if you would like to purchase this art, and I highly recommend it, purchase anything from David Mack. To purchase this, you have to purchase all the different layers, which would be incredible. But it's for someone that didn't work for a long time last year, maybe not right now, maybe next Christmas or something like that. Um, the Jim Lawson cover, again, Jim Lawson, who's drawn and written as much Ninja Turtles, if not more than Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Uh, uh, he did the cover for She Won, and Amy Joe bought that for me. Nice. Oh, wow. That's that awesome. a pretty good way to celebrate the first issue of, of a book coming out. And with Jim Lawson, I, I I met him, or Amy Joe met him a couple years ago, and I have some Jim Lawson Ninja Turtles art, which is all over my walls. I have some Mark Bagley art. Mark Bagley does a lot of Spider Man. Wow. I love Mark yeah. Bagley. And then with Jim Lawson, I met him at Rhode Island Comic Con about six months ago. And I was like, he should do a cover. How can we even ask Jim Lawson to do a cover? And I kept bugging Amy Joe every two days. I'm like, it's almost time, like the covers, the covers got to get done. The covers, we got to ask Jim Lawson. Let's ask Jim Lawson. And we're walking down the street one day, and she stopped. She said, shut up. You stop. Stop talking about Jim Lawson. <laughs> he is doing a cover. We asked him a long time ago. It's supposed to be a surprise, but you did not <laughs> shut up about Jim Lawson. So the surprise is ruined. Don't mention Jim Lawson ever again. And then the art came in a couple days later, and it's beautiful. It's my favorite cover. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I can feel the love on you. like, And that's what really I think I really loved about you as well, because just talking back and forth with you, that you you have the love for this world. And it's like from what you're working on, which is, of course, we're going to talk about Titans, going from working in this and getting to do what you originally wanted to do. I mean, how does it feel? I mean, I know you're still doing your real job, but how does it feel to get to do what you wanted to do from the get go? literal dream come true it was um probably shouldn't say this but last wednesday when issue two came out i left work we weren't shooting at but i literally went to the producer's office and i was like i'm gonna leave for 38 minutes and like, why and i'm like oh, yeah, i just can i leave for 38 minutes i'll be back like not, everyone's busy i know what's going on all these things no one's gonna miss me 38 minutes he's like yes okay you've never asked for anything but why i'm like my comic book came out. I want to go get it. He's like, "Yeah, that's pretty cool. you know, all right." Yeah. But even awesome. and even like we we get free copies from Boom eventually, and stuff it takes about a week or so. But just going to that store and picking up a book with your name on it yeah. off the shelf is it's just there's no other feeling like but it. And let even, me tell you this, man. Seen... I was gonna say I went to go. So I have I've reserved my copies, right? Uh, I have a Power Rangers box, obviously, but I went there because I was hoping to find a variant cover, um, and there's nothing on the shelf. Like they, they didn't have any extras. They they sold out um, all pre orders over there. So <laughs> we didn't even have any of on our shelves at, at my local comic book store. Yeah, I mean my store. I love my guys. I've been going to them since two thousand and four, so twenty years. I told them wow. about this book secretly a couple of years ago, and they're just like, "Well, yeah, sure, it's coming." I was sure, like they thought I was lying for years, <laughs> uh, and then and then it came out. And on the day issue one came out, I drove there like as soon as they opened. I'm like, where's my book? It's not on the shelf. They're like, what book? I'm like, the Power Rangers book. I've been telling you about it for years. They're like, that's real? Like, yes, it's real. It's every day. You didn't put my book on the shelf. I've been coming here for 20 years. And like they, they said, we ordered six and they all go in reserve boxes and stuff. So that's cool. So I literally, and this is so tacky, I literally bought, because I'd ordered a couple for myself. I bought one of my own comic books and I put it at the cash register. And I said, give this to somebody for free who you think will enjoy. And he said, yeah, sure. Wow. I'll do that. And then the next week I went back 
And I said, hey, uh, whatever happened to that thing that was I put here? He's like, I sold it. I'm like, you sold it or you gave it away? Like, sold it. I'm like, that's that's garbage. How could you do that? So he gave me one book for free that week. <laughs> for sure. Oh, oh, I bet you someone came in and was like, I need that. Like, I've been waiting for that no to come problem. out. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's sold out everywhere. I think maybe yeah. people under order. We went to an amazing store here in Ontario called Gotham Central and did a signing yes. the night that it came out. And he had ordered like dozens and dozens and dozens of copies and he sold out before we got there like wow. in addition to all the tickets that have been sold for the signing so That's it's awesome. been great seeing the support so um i want to start getting to issue one a little bit um because we start off on the episode or not the episode because it feels like episodes i'm used to power rangers but <laughs> we start off in the comic book you guys start off with the memorial with uh for trini trini kwan memorial park and youth center from once and always there was a lot of people that were you know, why did you have to have Trini die? You know, I know, you know, we know that Twee's gone. You know, we know that Jason's gone. But when you told the story, when you guys are telling the story, what made you guys resemble life in those aspects? I mean, just, the, yeah, there's no crazy secret answer. It really is because Amy Jo is so connected to these people as people and not just characters. It really, and well, so I, I should say, though, um, you know every, what happened to jdf was a tragedy this was actually written before that yeah. um so that's a whole other thing but with twee and trini in particular is it was amy joe was such a friend of hers and so it's just it never felt right to write an adult version of that character and where would they be it didn't feel quite right which okay. i respect entirely um, i like and this is what i like i like where y'all did it because and this is the thing so we're, i'm assuming it was cancer that took her is what she, the owners are talking about that she died from. Is that correct? Yeah, we didn't say cancer specifically, but when Billy's in the diner and she won, he says, yeah. he wish she could teleport diseased cells. So she died of an illness. Yeah. No. See, and that's the thing. And it's and it, it, you're keeping reality to it because, and that's one thing people, when they pass, you know, we're human and no matter what. And that's why I like what you did with Billy is that Billy's trying to create a better world by creating something with the power rangers powers to help heal people and so other people don't have to die in that way i love what y'all did in that aspect so so getting into issue two now uh because issue one you know we we get i don't want to skip to I, it's kind of weird because i you swerved us in issue two so it's kind of like <laughs> <laughs> but we get to and we're talking about the rules and that's one thing i want to bring up is, is zordon's rules like not to escalate a battle, not to not to give away your secret identity. But we start off issue two. We're starting off with revenge. Like this is like we are going to end this situation now because of what they did to Zordon. Because they say for Zordon for Alpha, right? So what 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 was some of the aspects you thought about when you were like, we're going to have the Rangers take it to the moon? What were some of the things that like you're like we want to tell and set up that story right there? Yeah, I, well, it goes back to wanting to push the power rangers to the limits like beyond what we've ever seen before and also from a, a bigger story perspective needing to give the rangers a win so that in 2023 those villains aren't around anymore so how would they be defeated and you know the power rangers always seem to do just enough to keep the villains at bay because of the rules so if you take away the rules you can defeat the villains and get rid of them so that the rangers can move on as characters is where it came from and it's, you, just to go back to something you mentioned before, like season one and a half, you're pretty much right. If I remember my own personal viewing log, Power Rangers when I was a kid, I remember, I think I remember, I remember Zed, which is the beginning of season two, I think. And then I think I went to the movie with my brother and I think I can remember like, I don't know who, who are these three people? What, what happened to the other ones? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you can sort of see where I stopped watching, which timed it really well with Amy Jo who's interested in celebrating the original, original team including Tommy, uh, but also like Zed is cool. So we wanted a lot of the original stuff. So yeah. that's where Zed and Rita get to be together. That's how we, we watched a lot of episodes around the season two premiere and why Rita left, but Zed stayed with the love potion and we just sort of kept them together. And so we kept the bad guys together, kept the good guys together and just went from there. Well, plus Zed is just visually appealing, like, you know, visually fun <laughs> to look at. So, yeah. um, and then, I mean, so reading the book and, and, Knowing you know Amy Joe's writing it and you guys are writing it, like Kimberly kills Rita. <laughs> like Kimberly kills Rita, like dump, like that's what it was. Like, what what made that decision to 
like go that go that far. That I mean, that's pretty serious for as far as the Ranger goes. Like that's that does not happen. Serious, and it's it's you know it's a few pages later, all the bad guys are dead, and the Rangers didn't go there to kill them. They have a benevolator. And full credit, we don't like to parse out who came up with what, but Amy Joe gets all the credit for Benevolator, which is just like the perfect <laughs> name for a Power Rangers like prop bomb yeah. to turn people good. So they went up there to purify everybody. Yeah. Um, and uh, they didn't intend to kill them. They didn't intend to kill Rita any either. Like they were there in secret. But again, when pushed too far with the world on the brink, with Zordon dead, yeah, she she killed her. And you know, we try to set it up in that she had no way to get across the room. She has a projectile-based weapon. Tommy is going to die. And again, if she's pushed to those limits, she's not going to let Tommy die and then run up and punch Rita. She's going to do whatever she can to stop Rita. And that includes shooting her through the back with an arrow and killing her. Um, one thing that also was in the book was you finally addressed uh, the morphine sequence taking too long. <laughs> <laughs> what, was that just like we got to get that in somewhere or what was yes that? this is one of those things that you know we've been massaging the scripts over and over and over and having the the actor strike and the writer strike last year gave us even more time to go back in uh, and when nico had started we could massage stuff even more too which is great this is one of those things that's been in there for years and i've just been waiting for the day that people could see this image and like when like nico drew it perfectly it's exactly the way it was in our heads and we're just like it's just like an instant classic moment because yeah why wouldn't they they're they're not like over there in the park or doing like she's like they're right there so of course yeah. she's gonna hit her in the head and it's awesome I, I think i've seen so many comments and memes already made it's like finally like someone actually <laughs> did it like yes. in, in an official product like of has yeah. or power ranger official thing like it happened it was a really cool moment um uh so you swerved with us on selena i you know we all kind of have an idea of what's going to happen but i thought selena was real too so i don't know what yeah. the idea is anymore um you know going into issue three you guys have released our amy joe released some pages um it does miss it is missing a little bit of uh, context um but what are some things that we can expect from issue three without spoiling too much well <laughs> i don't want you guys to trick me into saying anything so we talked about um kimberly killing rita repulsa in issue mm -hmm. two uh the we have there's there's just more to that the repercussions she has not faced those repercussions yet um so there's more to that than meets the eye wow awesome so you had, you had mentioned a couple of times that there were that the script has been you know uh edited a couple of times since the last four years that you have done it is there anything that you're allowed to share that has not that you guys took out and or original idea that evolved into something else there's one cool thing i'd love to share is that you know we were kind of done with everything before nico was even hired and wow. and I went um the last issue of sorry, the last episode of Titans that I worked on that uh, Jeff Johns wrote and was on set for was that thing. So God. I bugged him every day for Dude, advice. Dude, you work and, with Jeff Johns. Wow. <laughs> but he one of his main pieces of advice was like, don't write anything until you have your artist. And it just didn't, it just couldn't be that way on this. And so when we had our first sort of Zoom with Nico uh, way back, I want to say September. Nico loves the story. He was so complimentary. Compared us to Brian Michael Bendis, which wow. such a sweetheart. Sure. How can That's I say awesome, that? man. <laughs> um, but he he only had one note, and his note was in issue four. And I obviously I have to be vague here because I'm not spoiling anything. But he said this thing that happens on like let's say it's page nineteen. He's like, but if that happened earlier, then we could do this. And like the fans will want to see this, and like then this, and like yeah, more of this. And we're like, that's cool, Nico. Sure, whatever. And like, we hung up, and I was just like, if we did that, it would it would break the issue and the timing and the pacing. I don't think we can do it. And Amy Joe was just like, we have to do that. And I was like, the, the pacing and like that's like the end. That's the end. We can't have it happen in the middle of the issue. And Amy Joe's like, Nico owns a red Power Ranger suit. Nico is a fan. Wow. Nico is who we're making this book for. Like, listen to him. And I thought back to like what Jeff John said. I was like. Work, you work on the book with the art you write the book with the artist you collaborate and so nico as a fan was just like i'd love this but i'd love to see even more of it so if this happened here and we took the last 10 pages of the book and threw them out we kept the last i think kept the last like two or three pages and then everything between page 9 and 19 
is completely different because of Nico, our artist. Really? Who oh asked, my God. Ask for something as a fan. And he was right. It's so much better because you get more of this one thing that the fans are going to love. And I know I have to be vague and it's annoying, but when it's out, we can talk more about like, this is Nico's idea. And also, the ending was so cool. And we had to delete something that I really didn't want to delete. Oh. <laughs> but um, maybe now we know a little thing that we'd like to do for a sequel if we get to do a sequel. So all the better. Okay, guys, you got to tweet. You got to go buy these comics. You got to make sure we get a continuation. Which, which which leads into my last question. So, um, what what is going on now for Matt Hodson? I can't. I I mean, I'm going to bed now, so I'm really <laughs> working on a new show. I'm working on a new show that this is. It's the coolest show I've worked on since Titans ended. I can't say what it is, unfortunately. They're super super tight on security. Um, we'll talk more about it when they've announced it. So it's a show that exists in the world, and people are looking forward to it. It's great, and I think you guys will like it. It's it's sci-fi and fun and cool and funny. Oh my god! Awesome. And man. and I haven't had this much fun working on set in a long time. And it's sort of, I mean, I said a while ago. Sometimes the people that you work with, they make the show better. It doesn't matter what you're working on. Yeah. But if you get the people that you love and then work on a show that has amazing scripts, that's the best. So I'm having the time of my life. We've only been shooting for a week, uh, but it's it's a blast. That's awesome. Man. Nice. And- any, any, and we talked, you know, you just teased a sequel that you would, or hopeful. Once. I don't, I <laughs> once. <laughs> um, any more comic books that you would like to go into or besides Power Rangers? Yeah, throw a stone and I'll, I'll write whatever you're, I want. You're like, I'm ready. You got yeah, your ready. Are you ready? Oh, I got to <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, we have a relationship with Boom now, which is good. Amy, That's Joe, awesome. and I are, uh, we do have some other stuff, not Power Rangers at all. That we've been dabbling in and we'd like to pitch and then there's other stuff i'd love to do myself but the, like what a fun world and especially when you work on like i think the tv show we're on is like 140 something people on the crew it's huge but that's how many people you need to to tell this type of story with a comic book it's like you and your co-writer and an artist and an editor and it's just like the collaboration is so much more intimate and sometimes the results are so much more personally gratifying that i don't ever want to stop doing this so i hope it's not just a winner so hopefully I mean, are we, are we thinking sequel ongoing or uh, I would once, do, hopeful once, hopeful once? Uh, I would say let's do another sequel about this length. Everyone keeps saying it's too short, it's too short, it's too short. That's the ultimate compliment. Because, you know, whenever you work on a movie or a show and there's like, they should have cut 10 minutes out of it. Everybody seems to want more, which is great. Yeah. And so I think the story that we have, we kind of thought in our heads of what would be the ultimate. I mean, once and always is great, but imagine, you know, like a two hour long feature film. Yeah. With a $200 million budget, that's sort of what this is. And it's the appropriate length. And you get in and out in three acts, even though it's four shoes. Let's do another one like that. And we do, why wouldn't we want to do a sequel? It would be crazy not to. And if you're interested in what we might do with a sequel is wait till the very last panel of issue four. We're very happy that we told, we told a, like a very nice, tight four issue series in this world. And it's an open and closed case. You see where the characters have started. You see where they've gone, beginning, middle, and end. And then there's one panel at the end where you're just like, hopefully, we'll be like, and then that's what we'll do with the sequel. <laughs> that's awesome, man. So I got um, one question, too, for you. So you said you grew up and your brothers, your brother liked Power Rangers, and you, you got into Power Rangers. Because as you know, all of us had a crush on Damie Joe Johnson, Kimberly. So how was it you as a kid not knowing future self was eventually going to be with the pink ranger. How was it? I think I, I wasn't that, that I type that. of power. Yeah, of course. I wasn't that type of power rangers kid. Oh, okay. Um, okay. If I had, I would say saved by the bell was like when power rangers was on saved by the bell was on. I was yeah. a little bit older. So I was saved by the bell kid. So, um, what's, um, Kelly Kapowski. Oh, nice. Yeah. Don't totally enjoy. So that, 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 that <laughs> wanted me to have a crush, and I want to know. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's well, cool. Matt, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight, man. I really appreciate you coming. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we we need to have you on again after issue four comes off because let's talk more after issue four. You like you oh, guys are man. the reason why we're making this book. So your passion for this stuff it just makes us feel so happy. It's, uh, so thank you. It's been awesome talking. To you thank guys. you for making thank something you. so wonderful like just it's just it's been having so much fun reading this like i said at the beginning of this uh you know i 
I haven't really bought a comic in a long time, just to be honest with you. And I came back for the return and, you know, I'm picking up more boom comics now because I'm like, I'm in the middle of a story right now. I'm starting in the middle of a story, but like I'm in it now and I'm, you know, I'm doing these reviews of Ray. I'm having a lot of fun doing them. And uh, I thank you for bringing me back because I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, audience out there that is coming back for comic books, the medium, the, the franchise, whether it be that you brought so much more interest into uh, a situation that, you know, right now there's, there's not a lot going on for the brand. So again, thank you. You guys are doing an amazing job from what I'm reading and I can't wait for more. Thank you. Thank you. That's the ultimate compliment that it brought you back to the medium. And there's a lot of good stuff out there. Next time we'll talk about some other cool stuff you can hop on to because comics are killing it right now. Yes, everyone's telling me Masterverse too. That's what they're telling me. Masterverse is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ray, any last words? No, I'm good to go, man. All right, guys. Well, again, I'd like to thank Matt Hodson for coming on. Um, guys, the return issue three will be coming out here in April in about two and a half weeks. So I would really recommend you go into your local comic book store and reserving your copy or going to boomstudios.com, reserving your copy there as well. Um, these things are selling out and it's hard to get them after the fact. So <laughs> guys, make sure you're picking it up and y'all know what time it is. It's morphin' time.